appreciate it. I'm, I'm really excited to be here at the Blue Sky Gallery. I've been um, excited about this gallery for a long time. It's just, uh, it's an honor to have work here. I'm really glad to be a part of this. Sometimes I need to make sure I can project okay. All right, great. If you're ever like, oh, okay, I can't hear, just raise your hand and I will try to uh, project a little bit more. Um, yeah, so as Debbie said, um, I'm coming from St. Louis. Um, that is where I work and where I live as of January. I just moved from North Dakota. Um, and I was saying to a few people before we started that that gave me a chance to miss a really terrible winter there that included eight inches of snow last week. Okay, um, so today uh, I'm going to talk to you about my work uh, on the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, but I'm going to contextualize it also in sort of a broader uh, look at work that I've been doing in, um, in the Bakken region of North Dakota. So the Bakken region of North Dakota is where all of the oil that, um, that caused the need for the Dakota Access Pipeline is, is coming from. Um, so just, you know, a couple other things about myself and my practice. So uh, I'm a photographer who works primarily with landscapes. Um, I am someone who uh, is really interested in how and why landscape photography, uh, or how landscape photography can shape the values that we have towards the natural environment. So I'm interested in ways that landscape photographs participate in discussions about spaces, how they inform um, choices about how and why we use different spaces, and how and why we value different spaces differently over others. Um, so a lot of this work I've been trying to, uh, or a lot, of, a lot of these questions I have been directing at, um, pro or directing through projects that are looking at what I think of as marginalized spaces. So spaces like uh, wetlands or prairies or environments that we don't really think of as being um, hallmarks of uh, subject matter for landscape photographers and landscape artists, but, um, but that have really, really uh, important services and do things that, um, you know, that we all depend on, right? So, um, this is a series, or excuse me, this photograph is from a series of works that I did about um, wetlands that were adjacent to, uh, to um, CAFOs or confined animal feedlots in Iowa. So I was interested in thinking about representing these, these spaces that, are, um, that have the very real effect of, of filtering out chemicals and other things that are coming from these farming environments. Um, these are a series of questions I've, I've thought about in a very, uh, very practical way as well. So this is a photograph I did um, as part of a series about Minnesota watersheds. And what I wanted to do with a series like this was to say, like, how can I represent the kinds of things that make a landscape like a stream bed or, or a, um, a river edge beautiful um, in the language of landscape photography? So we think about things like erosion control as um, you know, stuff that we don't necessarily see, but something that really makes that landscape special. And so um, the challenge for a landscape photographer is to say, how can I talk about the magic that's inherent in these, in these environments? Um, so I offer those things as the context for the work that I'm doing in, the, in North Dakota and about the Dakota Access Pipeline. Because at the heart of it, this project is about the things that we can't see or the things that we don't fully have um, conceptualized on an individual basis and the things that, um, that, that, are, that are difficult to talk about um, without, without a strong set of visuals. Um, this is a photograph I took uh, in, in outside of the very beginning of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is in Stanley, North Dakota. Um, so the project about the Dakota Access Pipeline grew from, uh, grew from an interest in, in what was happening in the region. Um, I moved to the Bakken region, excuse me, to the Fargo, to North Dakota in 2014. So it was at the end of the, kind of what we think of as the boom in North Dakota. Um, but it was still a very, uh, a very busy time, and it was at the time, it was, uh, 2014 was when the planning and the, um, the permitting for the Dakota Access Pipeline was beginning. Um, and just kind of as a, as a framework, so the Dakota Access Pipeline, I think many of you know, is, um, it, it crosses four states. Um, it's, it's just barely shorter than the Keystone XL Pipeline, which a lot of people um, have, have some, um, you know, some knowledge of or have heard of before. Um, but yeah, so this is a, a map of its route, um, just to give you an idea of just how big it is. Okay. Uh, it crosses these four states, and as a project, it costs over $3.8 billion to, to execute. So it's a pretty massive undertaking. So um, most people are coming to the Dakota Access Pipeline or have heard of the Dakota Access Pipeline through the, you know, as Emmy mentioned, the protest camp that was started um, and uh, maintained by different groups of indigenous peoples from all over the world. Um, it was truly remarkable. I think, I think many of you 
um, you know, if, again, he might have some knowledge of this, but at one point there were over 100 different Native American tribes that had gathered together um, in the Standing Rock area in North Dakota. And this was one of the largest gatherings of Native American tribes that they had, you know, had had in centuries, like, or not centuries, but in, in a century. So it was an, it was an incredible um, place and an incredible set of energy, and it was um, bringing the conversation about this pipeline to the national attention in ways that it hadn't been. So the, the, the camp started, um, it began forming in April 2016. It started to really make headlines in about September 2016. So just to kind of give you an idea of what the timeline was. And this camp grew out of a concern about where the pipeline was crossing the Missouri River. So the pipeline had originally been routed to go north of Bismarck, which is the capital of North Dakota. And then after, um, some different studies, and, and I, I don't need to get into the whole permanent uh, or long story about how this happened, but they decided to reroute it so that it was in within 500 feet of the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, and right very close to where their water intake was. So there was a, a big concern about why it had been rerouted, what the potential risks were to the reservation, and it fit into a, a, a really long narrative of, well, you know, one of our backyards will put it down um, to people that don't have any agency to protest it. So this is where all of that um, kind of got started. So um, the camp was, a, was an incredible space. I don't know if anybody here uh, knew anybody who had gone there, but people from all over the country came to stand in solidarity with the Standing Rock tribe um, and to, to voice opposition to this whole process. Um, and this was something that, uh, where I was in North Dakota, I was about two and a half hours from, from where this camp was. Um, but it was a really big part, it, it was something that, that rippled throughout the whole state. I mean, we were all, um, everybody was, was very much in sync with what was, what was happening there at the time. Um, so, so I, you know, as a, as a landscape artist, as somebody who was really interested in conversations about land and how landscape photographs can participate and further those conversations, um, this, was, this was a very <coughs> big point of interest for me. Um, and this is just to kind of give you an idea. I don't know how many, of, actually, I'm going to ask, how many of you have been to North Dakota? Show of hands. All right, okay, that's, that's more than I thought. Okay, so, um, yeah, so a gentleman pointed out to me that, that North Dakota is actually the least visited state. So it's a, not a place many people have a, a ton of experience with. But this is a um, close-up view of North Dakota. So um, just to kind of give you an idea, the, this, this uh, patch here is the Bakken Formation. So this is where all the oil is that's feeding the pipeline. Um, Williston is the city that, that many people have heard of in connection with the Bakken um, oil pipeline and with the boom. Um, and then just to kind of give you an idea, Fargo is where, um, where most people are living in the state, and then Bismarck is right down here, and the Standing Rock Camp is right where my mouse is. Okay. But again, so I was, I was interested, and obviously I had, um, you know, I wanted to, to be supportive and be, um, you know, use my work to, to work in solidarity with um, the concerns that were being raised through these protest camps. But one of the things that I got really interested in was, you know, what kind of was my role uh, as an artist to, to participate in this? You know, I, I wasn't someone who was going to come and do work about the camp. It wasn't really a story for me to tell. Um, it was something I took part in, but it wasn't, wasn't really the question that I had. But I did have a lot of questions about my responsibility for it. Um, I am someone who grew up in New Hampshire. Do we have anyone in, from New Hampshire in this audience? Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad. Um, and in New Hampshire, uh, you know, we don't have connections with landscapes, or our connection with landscape is very different. Um, we're not, uh, we don't come into contact with a whole lot of agricultural production, natural resource extra extraction. Those are things that um, happen other places that we benefit from. Um, this is a view from my house, kind of just to give you an idea of, um, of the beautiful places that, that I get to grow up in. Um, but in any event, the idea of building an almost 1,200-mile pipeline was something that was a complete abstraction for me and was something, again, that I benefit from on a daily basis or the resources that are being pumped through there. But it wasn't something I ever really had to think about. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, and also, I just had no idea what big infrastructure projects were like. Like, the closest thing we had in New Hampshire was the big dig, if, we, if any of you ever heard of that in Boston. And this was this massive program, or excuse me, um, it was a $6 billion project to reroute a four-mile stretch of interstate um, that took over 15 years. So it was a, you know, big scale for New Hampshire, or for New England, I should say. 
but um, it wasn't anything like this pipeline. So, you know, I, I started this project with a very basic question, which is just, what does this even look like? You know, what we hear about this camp, we hear about all these issues. At this point in time, when the camp started in 2016, um, September of 2016, that pipeline was 98% built. Um, so, so much of that story had already happened. Um, it wasn't something that we really had a chance to weigh in on or think about or participate in a, you know, a discussion about because it had already been put in the ground. Okay. So the idea of like how do, we, um, how do we come to these discussions, how do we even learn about these things, and what does it even look like to have a pipeline be put down in the, um, the ground was very interesting for me. Um, this was a, just a quick view of what, what the Dakota Access Pipeline looks like at a different scale on the ground. And just to kind of give you an idea, I mean, the pipelines are, are a huge part of our infrastructure landscape in the United States. So we have more than, we have more, we have the largest network of energy pipelines of any country in the world. Um, and in the United States, that means it's 2.4 million miles of pipe. It's a lot of pipeline. And that's, um, and if we talk about just about North Dakota, um, we're also talking about 7,000 miles of transmission pipeline. And those are just the little pipelines, too, that go into the bigger ones that feed into the bigger ones. So it's this huge network of um, almost like veins that are under the ground that we just don't really have a whole lot of um, interaction with or, or, frankly, a lot of knowledge with. And I think that's, that, that, again, as a landscape photographer, something that's very interesting to me because I think um, one of the things that makes it challenging to talk about um, as a subject is that they're sort of boring, right? It's a pipeline that you know you, you rip up and hold the ground, put the pipe in, um, and then it's then it's just a disturbance in the landscape. And it happens in places like North Dakota that are pretty flat to begin with, aren't really places that we have a whole conversation or context for um, within landscape art and landscape photography. So what do we do to really talk about this as a subject? Um, that's some of the questions that, um, that I've really been thinking about. And again, just that this idea that pipelines, you know, because they're boring, because they are assumed to be neutral, they exert this incredible power um, over, over the landscape. Like if you think about it, what does it take to get the land, to get the permitting together, to put something that's nearly 1,200 miles across four states? That's an incredible power. Um, and it's one that, again, that, that very few people have a stake in, in in thinking about. Okay. Um, so yeah, just to kind of give you a couple other background um, points for, for this work. So this is a map of North Dakota. This was made, um, or this was something that a colleague in landscape architecture made for me. Um, all the red dots here are wells, um, or collections of wells. So this gives you an idea of the density of well pads that are in this, this um, part of the Bakken region. So. Um, I did a series, like just kind of a tongue in cheek. I was like, oh, I wonder if I could do 26 well pads and how many miles it would take me to just photograph and get to 26. Um, and it took me like eight miles to do that. Like, <laughs> it, it wasn't quite the density I thought it was gonna be. Um, but in any event, so that this gives you some idea. Um, and the, I don't know, some of you might have seen pictures like this before, but this kind of gives you an idea of what this landscape um, or just how much energy is, is being produced there. So this is a, a picture that's been taken at night and, and really gives you an idea of the scale of this development. And when you drive around there at night, it's, it's interesting because you know, it's not a super populated part of the country, but there are these flares everywhere. And at night, it just kind of, it's, it's a, it feels like a very different place. Um, so as I said, you know, I moved to North Dakota in 2014 and I had never been to the state before. It was totally new to me. I had everything to learn about the, the space. And, um, and I did learn a lot. I mean, there are lots of parts of North Dakota that are just breathtakingly beautiful. Historically, it was a place where a lot of ranching was done. Um, we had a lot of bison, a lot of pasture, a lot of, um, a lot of agriculture, um, but not a lot of road crops. So it looked, it looked a lot like this. And also to give you an idea, so um, this is just a map of North Dakota of the interstates, but when you are in Fargo, to get up to the Bakken region, you have to drive across the state and then up. Okay? So this is something that, um, you know, you're, you might only be like 400 miles away, but it can take up to seven hours to get across the state. So things are not close in North Dakota. It's a very, very big and vast landscape. So um, that's also important to know because even in the most populous parts of the state, there are many people who just have never been to the other side of the state or have never, um, really seen it or, or had um, a whole lot of contact with it. 
So, so when I started traveling out to Western North Dakota, um, you know, I was, I was looking for this really crazy oil booming landscape. And that was certainly there, but there's a lot of other stuff there too. I mean, again, it's a breathtakingly beautiful landscape. Um, it's not very populated, as I said. There are about 700,000 residents in the whole state of North Dakota. Okay, so it's not, not, a, not a whole lot of people. Um, it's an agricultural region with a very rich history of ranching. Um, open landscapes, dramatic skies, like it's a place where you feel the weather. It's a very, very striking environment. Uh, bison, um, and some fun facts. Uh, so North Dakota has the oldest mosque in the country, which is not a place you would think would have the oldest mosque in the country, but, um, but up in Ross, North Dakota, that's where that is, uh, which was built in the 1930s, by the way. So um, yeah, so, so for me it was really important to start this learning experience before I you know, really started working in the area, um, getting to know about the landscape, um, what it meant to be um, you know, a production landscape in North Dakota. People take a lot of pride in the fact that they are an energy producing area. Um, North Dakota has the highest production of wind energy per capita in the United States. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not something we always think of, but absolutely. Um, like a lot of parts of the Midwest, they do grow a lot of row crops and certainly more as the price of corn had increased. So that was another effect on the landscape. Um, but of course it was mostly oil. Um, there have been multiple booms, oil booms in North Dakota, um, starting in the 1930s, again in the 1980s, excuse me, in the 1950s. Um, was the first wells that were drawn um, and then in the 1980s, but this boom has been um, much more uh, rapid than So um, yeah, so it was, it was interesting to me to think about what it meant to see that change on the landscape. You know, because again, I'm you know, from New Hampshire, I don't have a whole lot of context for this landscape, so when I see cranes on a horizon like this, it doesn't seem like it's all that different or all that big of an impact, because that, that landscape and that horizon is so big. But to people who have lived there their whole lives, like this is a, this is a real disruption, or it's something that's very different. Um, and again, a lot of things that were making this boom different were the number of people that were coming in. So for those of you who don't, you know, or maybe didn't know about it, um, you know, it really peaked or started in 2009, right at the time of the Great Recession. So people were showing up in buses with no job, hoping to find something in North Dakota in the middle of winter in these small towns of 8,000 people that just didn't have a place for them. Okay. So just to kind of give you some context for this. So this was Watford City, a map of uh, Watford City, one of the peak oil producing areas um, in 1995, um, and then this was uh, how it was growing in 2010, and then this was uh, how big the city had expanded in 2014. Um, housing was a huge issue, and it was one of those things where like, people just couldn't catch up fast enough. Um, you know, there was a time in North Dakota where it was easier to find an apartment in Manhattan um, than it was in North Dakota, because there just wasn't space for them. Um, so I became interested in that as part of these questions about infrastructure. You know, what do you, what, um, how are cities dealing with this kind of influx, and how are they thinking about how they're reshaping the space or that, that's around them? Um, and again, you know, this was 2014, so the boom, the boom is starting to wane as well. So you had housing situations like this. So these were sets of um, man camps that were set up, that were used for a little while, and then now they're just waiting to be transported back to Texas, um, but just sitting there uh, until that happens. Um, so you have whole communities or separate communities that are living, um, you know, in, in small little lots like this that, uh, you know, that were never there before. And you also have a lot of buildings like this, this massive rush to build condos that now there aren't a whole lot of people to fill. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of money spent on things like building new roads um, to be able to accommodate all kinds of truck traffic. And yeah, so as, as I worked more in the landscape, I got a chance to meet more residents and, and learn about what sorts of concerns they had, uh, what sorts of things they felt you know, were really disruptive to the landscape. Um, one of the main things people really had objections to was just how much truck traffic there was. So a typical shale well in North Dakota is going to require about 1,100 truck trips to be able to make that well um, functional. So that's um, trucks that are bringing in equipment, sand, and water for drilling, uh, and, and hydraulic fracturing. And that's not counting all the times that you have to go and check that well after. So you have all these little roads that weren't really designed for, um, for tractor-trailer trucks to come. So dust was a huge issue. 
Um, and then pipelines, because they had to, um, had to be able to get the, the, um, the oil from the wells to be able to cut and connect to other pipelines to be able to, um, to be shipped out of North Dakota. So that was one of the biggest things for residents as well, these little gathering pipelines and these bigger pipelines. Um, they were rapidly, rapidly reshaping um, a lot of people's land. Um, pipelines vary in, you know, vary in scale, of course. Some of them are bigger than others, but they all ha are pretty disruptive. This is a, a part of the country that has a lot of, um, you know, long, the, the grasses that are growing in that area have been, you know, the, the ecosystem there is something that you can't just replace when you cover up the topsoil and seed stuff down. It's taken a long time to get that way. Um, pipelines have to be accessible, right? So if there's an issue with them, if you have a pipeline on your land, you have to, have markers, you have to be prepared for people coming on your land to be able to access them. Um, and for many people who are living in these landscapes, they're just a big, big scar. Um, this is just a close up view, so to give you an idea of what some of the crude pipelines just in North Dakota are. Um, the, the increase in pipeline construction in North Dakota has also come about because of um, just capacity that's been reached on rail traffic. So like, you know, there's only so much you can transport or so much oil you can transport by train. Um, and North Dakota reached that capacity a long time ago. Um, where I used to work in North Dakota at Fargo, I had a train outside my office and there were 80 trains that came by there every day. Like it was very busy. And trains derail and they explode sometimes. Um, this happened right before I moved to North Dakota um, in Castleton, North Dakota. Um, this was a spill that, that put out 500,000 gallons of crude oil. Um, and created a massive, created about $7.2 million in damage. Um, nobody was killed in this class, but, or excuse me, in this crash, but, um, but it was, uh, people had to be evacuated and it was pretty, pretty disruptive. So the sheer volume is what, what really led to, you know, the development of things like the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, I have kind of a short animation here. I don't know if this will work if I, oh. I don't know if it's gonna play. Okay, looks like it's on, but, um, what you can see here, the animation just kind of zooms a little bit so you can see. This is um, something my colleague in landscape architecture made, but all these pink lines are underground wells. So if you flip the landscape upside down, this is what it would look like. And these are all the wells that are feeding into this pipeline, the Dakota Access Pipeline that's going down to Illinois. So um, the Dakota Access Pipeline, again, came out of that need to, to reduce the, the, um, the impact on rails and to um, to be able to handle all of the oil that was being generated through this increase in production um, that happened in the region. So um, the, the, the pipeline came about, it's, it began, or people began planning that um, in 2014. Uh, it was a massive project um, that, that took a, a, long, a long time to get together. But the pipeline itself is about 30 inches in diameter and now, uh, now that it's finished is, is carrying 570,000 barrels of oil a day. Massive, massive infrastructure, and this is where it all begins. So, you know, again, as a, the, as you know, this project started out for me for just saying, like, I I'm new to North Dakota. I don't know what these landscapes look like. I I, I want to see what does this thing look like at the ground level. So let's start from the beginning, and we're just going to follow it, and we're going to see where it goes. And my original plan was to do the whole pipeline, but it turns out that takes a really long time, and uh, I I. Uh, was able to get through North Dakota, but eventually I'm going to hopefully to do the whole thing. Okay. But this is in Stanley, North Dakota, so um, I started photographing after most of the construction in North Dakota was done, but, um, but a lot of it was still going on when I, was, when I started photographing. So um, I started to, you know, again, just do a lot of driving. These are going through very, very rural areas of North Dakota where there wasn't, they weren't totally easy to access. Um, so it became a little bit of a, like a sleuthing game as to figure out where the pipeline route was, where it was gonna go. And a lot of times they're just these little markers. Like this is a, um, one of the companies that was responsible for, for planning parts of the pipeline route, but, um, but they were just one of many. And you didn't necessarily know that, that it was the Dakota Access versus something else. And these little markers in the landscape would give you some clue, but they, they weren't always there. So I got good at like following other signs. So these numbers were, you know, were to tell you, they were the number for different well pads, so they could give you some idea of where to go. Um, and I just start to, to get to know some of the, you know, some of the vernacular of the pipeline, this orange fencing, um, what this pipe actually looked like when it was in the ground, the kinds of things that were put out when it crossed a road. 
um, the gates. So all the gates for the Dakota Access Pipeline look the same. So there are these red gates with these little markers up here on the top. And then these little, um, these little more subtle signs that you'd see kind of just driving along. Um, and again, like, as I was doing this, it was just, it was this immersive experience of being in the landscape, but also um, getting sensitive to what it, what it actually looks like and, and, um, and how, to, how to tell from distance what it was. And sometimes the signs were a lot more, or were, were less subtle than others. So you just come to areas where just huge swaths of land had been pulled back. Um, and again, there are these orange fences. I mean, for me, they, they became both a, you know, they were obviously a marker for the pipeline and the construction, but also for me, they were kind of a metaphor, a visual metaphor for this parting of the landscape um, to put in this work. Um, so I made, you know, just to do this work, I made about 10 trips to this area over about a like eight month period. Um, so I was seeing it at different times of year um, and getting to know different parts of the pipeline a little bit um, better than others. And, um, and along the way, you know, I didn't want to just photograph the pipeline, but, but again, really to try to get a sense of what, what this landscape was and what was being affected and, and who, who was there. Um, this was a photograph taken pretty close to one of the river crossings. So something that's kind of interesting is that the, the path of the Dakota Access Pipeline goes through another reservation, or it goes right through a reservation in, in um, western North Dakota. Um, and uh, it crosses other parts, other rivers too. So it's, um, it's a very, very complex and, and big project. Um, so the farther that you know that I was getting away from the the big kind of primary area where the boom had been happening and where you know things were petering out a little bit and the pipeline was just crossing, there weren't well pads that were feeding into it. Um, the bigger these land sites became, so they were they were not the smaller ranches that I'd been seeing up in western north or in northwestern North Dakota, um, and the topography became a lot more diverse. So it um, it got challenge at, challenging at different times to be able to. Um, the pipeline construction was also done in parts, so you know, depending on how things were going with um, getting access to the land and being able to cross certain areas, you'd find some areas that had been seeded the previous year and other areas that were just, that were just brand new. Yeah, and again, just to kind of give you an idea of, of this path that I was following through North Dakota. So Fort Berthold is the other reservation that's in, in North Dakota. So you have the Standing Rock. Uh, reservation which extends into South Dakota, but then you also have the Fort Berthold, which has been really um, tremendously affected by the boom. Um, so yeah, and as I got closer to this camp, it was interesting because these pipelines suddenly started having no trespassing signs, and they suddenly started having a lot of barbed wire, <laughs> or um, uh, concertina wire, and security. So there were whole sections of the pipeline that, you know, in November 2016, you just couldn't get to because they would only let residents get by. Um, these two pictures are, are Lake Oahe, so this is um, just north of the area where the pipeline was crossing under the river that um, was close to the Sacred Stone Camp. Um, and just a few more pictures from the camp just to kind of give you an idea of what that looked like. There was uh, helicopters, there was all kinds of, um, well, police and military presence in North Dakota. And again, I, th I think many of you are probably familiar with a lot of that. This was taken from the camp. Um, and this is the other side. So um, this is where the, around where the pipeline came out, and this is what it looked like when it came out on the other side of the road. So that part was just a little bit further south. And so you can see uh, the places where, where, uh, where it was newly covered. Um, you still had problems with, you know, again, housing was a huge issue. This was, this was a photograph I took pretty close to one of the camps before you got close to um, the river crossing. So these are all pictures from that second half as we're getting closer to South Dakota. Um, things opened back up again. It became um, not something that really stuck out on the landscape in the same way that, um, that, I, had, that I had been seeing up in North Dakota. Um, I wanted just to show you, I, I went back to the Standing Rock camp about a year after I had been there, and so in September 2017, because um, I wanted to see what had happened you know, after 
um, after the camp had been disbanded. Um, and, I, and I took some pictures there today, so I just wanted to share these with you, just, just for information. So a lot of the signs are still there, um, but it's all roped off now. Um, so it's, it's, you can, I, I don't think you're supposed to go over and walk around in it, but there really aren't any people there. Um, people have left um, different sorts of offerings there. Um, there's been graffiti that's been left. Signs uh, along the river, and then um, just to kind of give you some some perspective. So this is what that camp looked like today, and this was roughly about the same angle um, that that this photograph was taken. Um, this is the Cannonball River, um, what it looked like back in, in 2016. chance to be able to um, share some of the work that I had done with them and to get some feedback on, on what I was doing. So um, that was really helpful for me at the time. I mean, I think they were, they were, they were happy to see the, you know, kind of the broad scope in which the things were, were being contextualized in, in the larger series, but, um, but I learned a lot more from them in terms of like what their, what their own experience was, what the pictures that they took. Um, so it was more—it was more of an exchange of saying, like, this is kind of the part that I concentrated on, and then I'm learning more from you. But, um, but yeah, absolutely, I got—I got some really helpful feedback from them, or from the people that I talked to in. in yeah. Please. So I have a question about uh, sort of your intention for the project. I yeah. Mean, it's you. Your your project can be sort of purely informational. It's like, well, what does this place look like? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, and but there's also a advocacy like like if you think we have national parks we could go photograph them and say look this has to be saved so it, it's funny because it seems to me you strike a balance between not not making dramatic Ansel Adams kind of pictures but but not um, not shying away from advocacy for protecting the land either yeah absolutely so one of the one of the really um, important parts of the project for me has been this collaboration with my landscape architecture colleague. Because what we're doing, um, you know, and I didn't talk a ton about this in this talk, but um, he, you know, he makes these boards that kind of break down these these public reports and just like how much impact, you know, these are just numbers. Right? He's he's making those visual, and then my work oftentimes is made in response <coughs> to some stuff that he's doing. So I think some of that is where I want to see the more advent, you know, or where I see the work having a greater role or a greater activist role because it's um it's helping to just distill information i mean that's the thing it's like there's just so much information about all this that it's overwhelming and at the time you you really confront that information it's usually because there's been a spill right or something really horrible has happened like someone you know you hear a story about a lender having a conflict or someone losing their mineral rights or some just kind of horror story with an individual in a corporation but at that point, it's just such a small piece of that bigger puzzle that unless we have some kind of idea of like this really boring permitting process or this really boring um, breakdown of charts, um, we're, we're never going to be able to participate in those conversations. <coughs> they just, it's, it was striking to me just how could people even really knew this was happening um, until it like, you know, until somebody showed up and was like, well, we basically, we have to wrap this pipeline through your yard. Um, and there really wasn't a whole lot of people could do about it. Yeah. There's been so many political events in the process in the last few years. Yeah. Can you refresh our can you refresh my memory how this was resolved with the standing rock protests and the legal issues involved? 
Yeah, I don't think the legal issues have been fully resolved. I mean, the, the sticking point was to what degree they, they needed to go through another, um, another review before they did the final crossing underneath the Missouri River. So before Obama left office, he said basically like, no, we need to do some more. Like the, the reviews have been incomplete. And, and, and some of the review wasn't so much about not having the pipeline or having it, it was about the route and about the fact that the, where they wanted to put the pipeline itself was uh, there, were, there were artifacts and they hadn't done a, like a full environmental assessment and, and an archeological assessment for, for what was being disturbed for the construction of the pipeline. So that part was what was really holding it up and then Obama kind of said, yep, we need to do this for the review process. And then when Trump came into office, that was really the first, well, not the first, but that was one of the first things he did was just say, no, we don't have to go through that process. Like you can complete the pipeline. Um, and I think like, again, that, that's been challenging courts. Like some of the, the legal parts of it have still continued to go on. But um, but they got the go ahead to, to finish the the, the construction. Um, but yeah, I mean, like when when the when you know when things really heated up and there were clashes between uh, you know military police and protesters, that pipeline was was being constructed. It wasn't like they ever stopped. Yeah, so it was just a matter of whether they could finish it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, so was your original sort of dream to like something like to take a picture of every Yeah. What was your original sort of vision? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought at first. Like, cause, well, I, cause partially I just want to see if I could do it, like what it would, what it would look like. So I was trying to find every crossing that it went over a road. Uh -huh. um, and again, because there aren't tons of roads in some places, like that, that was easier in some parts than others. But eventually, it just got to be kind of monotonous. And I was like, all right, I found another gate, or I found another stretch of this line. And so I was like documenting it, but I wasn't really asking a whole questions with the photograph. So that's when I started to get a little bit more like I'd go like two miles away from the from the route and really start to think about how it fit in there. But yeah, at first it was like, let's just see what happens if I try to do this. And um, it, uh, yeah, I think that it ended up to be a pretty boring series. <laughs> but maybe. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, that's what's kind of interesting to me too. So, you know, again, I, I, I will at some point you guys are out hearing me. I will at some point finish this route um, and photograph the rest of the states. And, and that's gonna look really different because they just don't have the oil infrastructure you know, boring all this. So the places where the pipeline goes, it's, it's gonna look really different. Places where I've seen it in Iowa and in South Dakota already, like it's totally different than what it was in, in North Dakota. So. But somewhat, so I mean, I haven't talked a lot about the work that's in, in the gallery here, but the like experimenting with a grid format was was trying to get somewhat at like what is the what is the pace of this route like if you were driving around this what are the kinds of things you see like what what's the rhythm that gets established as as one is traveling through this landscape so that's kind of my attempt to get a little bit closer to this idea of an interval but without like making you know that this is like mile two or mile forty seven or something yeah thank you for that question. Actually, I think about it a lot because I think some of the best critiques of the new topographics photographers was that they were photographing changes that were happening in the landscape and reshaping the landscape to make room for houses and suburbs, but they were never bringing in a social context to what, what that development was in the landscape. So they were just taking this formal approach of like, hey, this is what it looks like to have matchbox houses every you know three miles or something. Um, so I like to think that I'm trying to come at this by like foregrounding my own position, which is to say that I don't, I don't have a connection to the space, but I do. Um, and also like this, this is not happening. This development is not happening in isolation. It's part of a, a broader set of decisions that we've made as a country about how we want to produce energy and how we want to make some parts of the country have to carry our costs and other parts don't. So, so the new topographics really were more pure formal, as you know, like, and so I'm, I like to think that I'm trying to bring in that social context, so yeah, one of my one of my mentors um, was Deborah Deborah Bright, and she um, she wrote a lot about just how important it was to be. You know, you can photograph these formal changes on a landscape, but unless you're really thinking about some of the more boring stuff or how it fits into a broader puzzle, like you're you're always missing something. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do. I don't know if I always <laughs> succeed at it, but that's the goal. Great. That. 
mostly like uh, row crops. So it wasn't quite as difficult to get these like straight lines or straight diagonal lines across the landscape. So their disruption wasn't typically happening like, it, it wasn't it was quite as visible for one. And they just didn't have a, like it, it just kind of felt like you were driving through a, like a bunch of cornfields, right? You didn't, you didn't ever see any oil infrastructure or even the areas where they were like, you know, they had a big access point to check the levels in the pipelines. You just didn't see those in the same way. So like when, it, you know, when I do see pipelines like in you know, New Hampshire, markers where things are going, it's just like a yellow point on the road. Like it didn't look much different than that. So, so you, I guess maybe a better way to say it is I didn't see the scale of that impact in the same way as I did up in North Dakota. Um, and it might have been different like if I had been there you know, during the initial construction, but it's, it's, it's been interesting how much more absorbed it seems to be in the landscape. The construction for the pipeline started in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you were to continue with the project, as you get further southeast from North Dakota, where there's less oil infrastructure, just judging from your photos, it, it would seem like you're going to find very little visual evidence of the pipeline. Yeah. Because of the nature of that area. But what are you imagining that you all see there? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because it's what's so interesting to me is that it's like the same pipeline, it's the same size, it's the same, but, but the but visually it's, it just doesn't stick out quite in the same way. Um, so I, I don't really, I don't know quite yet. I mean, I think a lot of the things, or one of the things I know is different, you know, not so much in South Dakota, but certainly in Iowa and the parts of crosses in Illinois, so they're a lot more populated. And so there's a lot more places where it's crossing near a city or it's crossing a, an area that people have a lot more contact with. So I'm kind of interested to think about what it, what it means to have that mark or reshape that landscape, like, because that landscape was probably already pretty, pretty well manicured and, I mean, manicured is not the word, but it was already being used in, in a very direct way. So people have more contact with that space, but what does that mean for how it looks now? I'm not sure. I mean, it's interesting because, like, now I actually just figured this out the other day, but like, where the pipeline ends in Illinois um, and it connects to another one that goes down to Louisiana, like, and that's like an hour and a half from where I live now. But yeah, no, I'm like, why haven't I been working all spring? Um, but uh, it's a, you know, but I know that area looks, it, it's cities, you know, so what is, what's that going to look like there? I'm also hoping to do a lot more, you know, connecting with different people that are living very close by and just to kind of, I'm interested in a lot of the stories of how their their own land was reshaped and how like they see their land being, you know, being affected. Um, you know, something that was very interesting in North Dakota is that's very different from, you know, again, from me growing up in New Hampshire is that people take pride in the fact that their land is being used to produce energy. People are proud of that. It's just they just don't want it to get like, like, do you have to really rip up all of this? Could you just route it over here so we don't have to bulldoze that hill? You know, it's, so it's the, the varying degrees of which they see land as being being a resource is very different. Like I see land as a resource as like a spiritual resource. It's this place where I go to get renewed and um, you know appreciate the beauty of things. And people people feel that way in places like North Dakota, but they're also not necessarily against the idea that something's happening there, which is really different to me. Like I have to kind of check myself and think. Well, when I'm photographing this, I need to be aware that what, what seems like a big deal to me may or may not be. Or the thing that I'm not even thinking about that's a big deal might really be a big deal. Like the trucks, like people are really upset about all the trucks because they couldn't get anywhere. Like they're, you know, trying to drive their tractors around and there's just, or there's dust all over their crops. Like it's a totally different, um, yeah, reaction that I didn't even, I didn't even have context for, so. All right, thank you.